where we're sharing expertise and tips and opinions from our, our suppliers, friends, and, and colleagues. Now, a vendor is a, an events marketplace that's been designed to allow our customers to go online and create their own bespoke events by combining numerous products from numerous different suppliers, all in one bucket. Uh, so, you know, in the previous world, it could be a Gordon Ramsay restaurant with a uh, go ape climbing plus a minibus. Now, as we're in a slightly different world at the moment, with uh, lots of virtual things happening and everyone being locked down, we're shifting our focus a little bit. And this is the second of our uh, webinars on virtual products. And the overall aim is to really help you do events better. Now today's webinar is using coaching to help manage your remote team. We're looking at probably 30 minutes, of maybe 40 minutes maximum. And obviously it's been designed for managers of remote teams. Our agenda will be this, uh, the benefits of coaching, coaching versus the alternatives. Should I be coaching my team or not? Essential skills of coaching your team, practical tips to apply, and specific remote coaching challenges and solutions. So at this point, I'm going to introduce our guest speaker, who is Mike Lieber from New Results, who is one of our very first uh, suppliers with a vendor. And we're very lucky that they were actually recommended to us from, from another supplier, which is really, really nice to do. So hi, Mike, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. So I didn't realise we've been recommended in. That's nice. I was I drifted off slightly though because you were talking about good restaurants and the rest, and uh, <laughs> I was thinking that that'd be nice. That'd be nice to be able to get out again, won't it? I'm sure there's other pressing priorities, but it will be quite yeah, nice. Yeah. yeah. Literally, I met um, I met Neville, your co-director. Yes. Via uh, Crystal Maze in London. Yes, we've done some work with Crystal Maze, uh, the London yeah. experience, and we also we've done the Manchester one and. Yeah, uh, fully recommend it. So it's a brilliant, it's a brilliant few hours to get lost in. Uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and it's yeah. really nice. That, you, know, um, you guys should work, work with a new result. So uh, yeah, that's the reason we work together. Oh, uh, well, that's good. That's, that's good. quite a nice story. Yeah. So I'll, I'll go on to the. Oh, so yes, yeah, so Mike, tell us more about yourself and new results. Um, yeah, new results. Um, based in the northeast, but we serve clients across the UK and. Uh, we do some international work as well, which is always good fun. Um, I guess if we're summarising what we're experts in, it would be the online, the virtual, the first-to-first -first delivery for coaching, for sales, and for LinkedIn. You mentioned Nev. Nev is the author of Sales Success on LinkedIn. And uh, you can imagine that we're getting a lot of inquiries around the LinkedIn side, especially at the moment. So the LinkedIn and the coaching are, are two big, uh, big courses for us at the minute. We train coach, we train managers so that they are able to coach, and that's whether they've never done it before or whether they've been doing it for quite a while. Um, I've been coaching for, I think this is my 25th year now in coaching. Wow. So obviously I started when I was six, uh -huh. uh, which is quite young. And coming from a banking background where um, coaching was uh, quite fortunate, really, coming, coming from a background where coaching was um, a part of the big part of the culture. So, uh, okay. yeah, I think our, our first webinar last week was on, on virtual team building, and that was yes. one of our suppliers who had created some really great new products in the last you know, few weeks. But you guys are much more experienced, aren't you? you you've been around for a while doing online training, so it's yeah, really we, new to you, is it? We've, we've got a, an online platform. Um, and again, that can be accessed through through the New Results website. Uh, but in terms of the remote side, as I said, coming from banking, uh, I, I was managing and coaching remote teams for, for most of my career. Uh, okay. And in terms of the, the remote clients, I suppose the furthest west would be Vancouver and the furthest east would have been uh, somewhere in Australia. So we're, yeah. we're, we're used to doing this, coaching, coaching remotely. Um, is kind of bread and butter to us at new results perfect okay well, then should we crack on yes i'll be on the first slide so this is your exit summary do you want to go go through these, these points for us? yeah um i'm hoping this this is going to do the job of of helping folks to understand kind of what we're going to be covering off and uh, and not giving them the temptation so oh, we've done everything now we'll disappear off uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll be talking about the the way that coaching causes learning to become stickier so uh, rather than telling and again we'll get into that into more detail 
we'll talk about, and I want to position coaching up front as it's not a panacea, it is one of a number of tools that should be in any manager's toolkit, uh, particularly now whilst most people are working remotely. But with any tool, you need to understand why would I use it, when would I use it, and how will I use it, which is a nice link into the conscious competence model. The conscious competence model is a brilliantly simple way of being able to identify, is this a skill that I should be coaching on, or do I need to be using one of the other tools in the toolkit? We'll look at some of the best practices, what are some of the key tools that I'm going to need to be able to be a coach, and that's the ask, stop, and listen, and the playback, and we'll explore it in more detail. We'll also talk about, I know we're doing this for remote workers, but remote means a lot of different things from an emotive point of view for different people. So we'll explore that and we'll look at what are some of the challenges and equally what are some of the solutions uh, when we are coaching remote teams. Uh, and finally, we'll look at um, what are some of the key things that as a coach we need to be aware of. And that includes uh, what we focus on and also the location because they are key mm -hmm. to making this successful. Yeah, perfect. Okay, coaching, yeah. what are the benefits? Um, so, so this would apply to whether you're coaching remotely or whether you're coaching face-to-face. -face. Uh, and, and really, and for anybody who knows me, they'll know that I'm going to start talking about the brain um, because we need to understand what happens in the, in the adult human brain when we're coaching compared to when we're doing telling, I suppose, would be the, the big alternative to this. Uh, and it's how, the, it's how the brain predicts what's going to happen because that's what the brain does a lot, spends a lot of its time doing, is it, it's trying to make sense of the world that it's in. And to do that, it will try and predict what's going to happen. And the, the conflict that arises between telling and the brain is because when we're about to go into a situation, the brain wants to predict and, and kind of likes to expect what's going to happen. But if somebody else is going to tell you what's going to happen, then mm. your own brain might not agree with it, it might predict or expect a different outcome. And this is why telling is an issue, because somebody else thinks this is what's gonna happen, these are the outcomes, but your brain might expect and predict a different outcome. So we get some resistance. So naturally in any situation, we can feel a resistance, or we know that there is a resistance takes place in the brain when somebody is telling you. Now, when you're coaching or when you're being coached, that isn't what happens. When somebody's coaching you, what happens through the questioning process and that, that, that helping process is it helps your brain to map out this is what's going to happen, make sense of it all. And so it becomes more accepting. And this is why learning that's uh, developed through coaching is stickier because your brain is predicting, it's expecting, and there's no conflict. This is what is going to happen. There's a particular chemical that's in place that's called myelin. That, uh, that helps to cause this to, to effectively stick in place in the coach's brain. So we know straight away that telling is likely to lead to resistance, but coaching is much like much more likely to cause that learning to be sticky. So, yeah. so there's one thing straight away that when you are coached, what you learn through that process is much more likely to stick in the brain and ultimately, ultimately more likely to go on and become a habit. The, the second benefit is if you don't coach and if you only go on telling, so if, if all you do is you say, here's my bank of knowledge, and if I pass that across instead, it's almost like a mentor, mm. you're limited by how much you know. You can't, you can't take somebody beyond what you know. So if I was, well, if I was going to um, teach somebody about everything I know about the Industrial Revolution and its impact on the social uh, economic policy, that's not going to take me a long time to, to, to get through all my knowledge on that. And the issue is, if you, if you rely on me just telling somebody that once we've exhausted my knowledge, then that person is not going to go any further because that's yeah. all I know about it. So that becomes an issue. You're restricted by how much does the person who's telling you actually know. When you're coaching, of course, you can coach on anything. Uh, one of the most interesting coaches I ever had was a show jumper. I've never sat on a horse in my entire life. Now, if we'd have based on the fact that I can only tell what I know about show jumping, then that would have been one of the world's shortest conversations. As it happens through applying coaching te techniques, I was able to help that rider to clear a higher jump. Okay. And, and, and the, the third point is you, you almost have unlimited development because, because of the second point there, we're not limited by what the, the teller, the instructor or the trainer knows through coaching you can 
you can really explore how far do you want to go or how far does this coach you want to go in developing their skill around a particular thing so it's it's uh that, i think that advertisement was brought to you by the the coaching board but the, but there really are some very strong benefits to coaching yeah. somebody and, and there's also research to show that it um it gives you a strong return on your investment the time that you put into coaching but it's also good for motivation as well okay okay that's good yeah, so uh, I mean, I think you kind of touched on it a little bit already, but you know, uh, yeah, what are other sort of alternatives really? It, yeah, there's this is kind of going back to what we we're saying at the beginning. You, you've got to think about this as being a toolkit, and I know that's not an exhaustive list by by any means, but probably these are the most familiar tools that get dipped into when we've got somebody who needs some development, needs needs to progress or learn something in some way. Training and speaking as a trainer and speaking as a mentor. Um, we know that there's a time and a place for using training and there's a time and a place for using mentoring. Um, but telling's on there and telling, telling if any of those are going to be kind of insidious, it's, insidious, it's, it's the telling one. It does get a bad rap and, and I kind of feel the need to defend it a little bit. There is, there is a time and a place where, uh, where telling is appropriate. Um, if you're in a, an emergency situation and you need yeah. to take very fast action, telling is appropriate. Yeah. If, if if there's if there's an emergency response required, it probably isn't appropriate to say, okay, well, what, what are our options? Let's explore them. How do you feel about that? which one? Do, you know, if you've got an emergency situation, telling is required. Again, coming from a, a regulatory high compliance background, there were certain bits of the job where you, you had to be told this is what you need to say yeah. by this point. For example, during a mortgage interview, there are certain things if you're giving advice that you need to say up front, and there's certain certain phraseology that you have to use. So, so in some cases, it is appropriate to tell. The, the issue is where we've got a toolkit and we start using the wrong tool for the, for the situation that presents. Yeah, and yeah. and telling, of course, of the four that are on there, telling is probably the easiest one. We don't really need to be trained on how to tell someone because you just you access your own thoughts and and off you go. So it's it's interesting to be able to say, right, well, we know that coaching is an option, but equally to raise the awareness and say, well, what are the other options? What's the, what's the rest of the toolkit look like? And then second, secondly, to say, well, what is my bias? Do I have a tendency to go for one of these? And rather than saying, well, what is the situation that presents and which is the best of the, the tools in the toolkit? What should I be using? Yeah, uh, I think it kind of brings me to a question we had before the uh, webinar. It was what advice do you have to explain to managers or leaders who who normally manage uh, so who normally micromanage how they integrate virtual team coaching into their teams? And it kind of looks here, me, doesn't it? Really? Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right, Simon. This is where uh, telling goes by a few different names, and micromanaging is one. Micromanaging is a funny thing. There was. A, I was reading something in Harvard Business Review, and I can't, I can't remember who wrote it, so apologies to the author. And they were saying that, isn't it funny how many people complain about being micromanaged, but at the same time, how few managers ever hold their hand up and say, I am a micromanager. So there's a bit of a disconnect somewhere going on. But when we talk about micromanaging and assuming that it really isn't needed, we kind of need to get to the bottom of, well, why would somebody, if somebody's consciously doing it, so, so if it's not needed, because it's not appropriate to the situation, there are other tools that would be better better applied. And if they are aware that they're doing it, then why are they doing it? And and I think as the the question from Nicola was, so so how do you kind of move towards coaching instead? So looking at the situations and looking at the options, one of the most common times this this happens is if somebody has been uh, an expert player in their field. So so let's think about how many people have been in sales. And because they've been very good at hitting their targets, they've become the the leader of a sales team. And it doesn't always follow that someone who's good at selling it should be good at leading a team of sellers. But in this situation, which I'm sure we're all familiar with, somebody who's been really good at selling it has been selling it probably in a particular way. And, and certainly what we observe in new results is somebody who then is moved into leading that team role. They expect all of the new team, team of sellers to do it in the way that they did it because it was successful. And they have a tendency to become the micromanagers because they just want to ensure that the team is successful and they're successful in their new role by making everybody do it the same way that they used to do. So so what they've not done is made the move from, I'm not now doing it, I'm now the manager and I need to think about this in a different way. 
So what are the tips? Well, they need to remove themselves from that group. They need to learn to delegate as part of this. And, and once, you, once you start to delegate, that kind of goes hand in hand with coaching because you're not just dumping it on someone, but you're having that conversation around how can we cause this to happen. And the second bit is that what we're focused on then is the outcome, getting a successful outcome, but not necessarily how it's done. Yeah. So we can say this is as a team what we want to achieve and then invite the team to say, what are the ways in which we can do it? Uh, and, and the third tip that we'll give on this is, we need to be clear on how well I know that the team is doing this without me poking my nose in all of the time and you know staring over the shoulder, doing the whole micromanagement piece and observing every single step along the way, but instead saying to the team again, how will I know that you're on the right track? How will I know that this is being done? And again, inviting that response back from the team. And a yeah. number of things happens there. They're more likely to buy into it and they're much more likely to apply uh, their collective um, experience, their collective creativity. So you expand out the number of ways in which any particular job can be done rather than going back to the example of, well, when I was selling, this is how I did it. Therefore, as a team, I expect yeah. to do it that way. That way. Okay. Let's move on to the next slide. And this I think is probably my my favourite of your slides. Um, so, so, so explain to our viewers about this slide, Mike. It's, it's really interesting. Yeah. So yeah. So so this, is, as the the header of the slide says, this is to coach or not to coach. So when we said before, we've got this range of tools. What we need to understand is so when is it appropriate to use coaching, and how how will I know? So this is the conscious competence model, and the, the curve gets drawn in different ways, but we particularly like this, this version of it. As far as I can tell, this version goes back to 1982 uh, and Howell's. So Howell's 1982 version of the conscious competence model. And what we're looking at here is we've got the four quadrants, and on the horizontal axes, we go from somebody being incompetent in terms of a skill, to competent, and I keep saying in terms of a skill because this isn't about a full person. This is yeah. only ever about one particular skill that we're looking at. So someone is either at the extremes incompetent, so they can't do it, or the competent they can do it. And then on the vertical axes, we've got at the top uh, the unconsciously doing so, so they're not even thinking about it. Down to conscious at the bottom, and and what happens? And it's nice to work with a skill. So if if we use one. Uh, that I think most people would be familiar with, which is learning to drive. And certainly for anyone who's either had or is having or has passed the test, having lessons, then they'll understand this. So so as a, as a very young child, being driven around by my parents in the car, I was in the top left. And uh, when I was two or three years old, I didn't know that I couldn't drive. I wasn't thinking about it. It was nowhere in my consciousness that I didn't know as a two or three-year-old that I couldn't drive. And then if we fast forward to the point, certainly I, I was living in the West Midlands when I learned to drive. And I remember the first lesson I ever had with an instructor called Alan. And the first time I got in the driver's seat, I went, right, you know, it's, you know I, I realized I very that. quickly I couldn't drive. And then I had a series of dri driving lessons and I got to the point where I passed the test and I could drive, but I could only drive when I was thinking about it, when I focused on it. And I remember, within the first few days of learning to drive, and I was giving a friend a lift, and, uh, and he got in, he wanted to chat, he put the radio on, and it's like, what are you doing? Yeah. I said, I, 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 said, I, I can drive, <laughs> but I can't drive and have a conversation. I can't drive and listen to music. And, and most people I've spoken to went through this same pattern of, I didn't know I could drive, um, I, I didn't realize I couldn't drive, to, I then very quickly realized in the first lesson that I couldn't drive. And I got to the point where I could drive, but only if I could um, only focus on that. Yes, yes. And, then we, and then we get to the point quite quickly where with experience and with practice, we can do it. We don't really have to think about it. And some would say you're on autopilot. Someone said it's muscle memory, whatever it is, habits are formed. But we go through this curve of didn't know I couldn't do it. I've realized I can't do it. I can do it, but only if I concentrate on it. And I can do it and I don't even have to think about it. And then there is a, there's a bit that goes off, which is where we are unconsciously super competent. So we stick with the driving thing. Think about people like Lewis Hamilton, who have got car control and driving skills. So this whole other level. And equally, there's unconscious complacency, which is where very bad habits come into play and where sometimes it's useful to come a bit further back down and start to do things again, but while we are consciously thinking about it. Now, in terms of coaching, and the other tools, what normally happens is when we're on, on the left-hand side of that vertical, when we're, when we're in this area of 
I'm incompetent and I'm conscious of the fact that I'm incompetent mm. for this skill, normally at this point we would have somebody instructing us. And that might might be somebody who's telling us, and again, that's relevant, particularly in an emergency situation where you need very fast direct action and you need to get it right. Normally, it's we would um, seek an instructor, a trainer, or even a mentor to help us at this stage to give us the key skills to impart that information to help us to move from this per this place of I realise I'm I can't do this. Help us through that skill set through the knowledge transfer to get to the point of I can do this, but only when I'm thinking about it. And at this point, normally when we're in this bottom right, this conscious competence. That's normally where a coach would come into play and help us to move up to kind of owning it and putting our own stamp on this skill set and developing that skill in a way that who, who knows what the potential is. You know, it might be that we all end up being um, super com uh, super competent but unconscious. Yeah. And that's, that's where the coaching takes us. And the important bit is that coaching continues. So when you think about your Lewis Hamilton's, when you think about... Uh, the, the Williams sisters for tennis, those those number one professionals in their sport continue to have coaches. So there isn't there isn't a natural point at which you say coaching is no longer required. It's really up to the individual to say, actually, how good do I want to get at this? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. yeah. So this is this is a, I, I agree with you, Sam. This is a great tool. It's nice and simple to use, and it helps us to identify for any given skill set, uh, any given skill. Where is the individual? Where do they want to get to? And um, is it appropriate now to be using coaching or one of the other other tools? Yeah, and uh, we've got a right question here from Costas. Uh, can someone train themselves in team coaching if they don't have budgets to bring in coaches right now? And how would they go about it? Um, it, it, it it's lucky that I'm in my office because what I can do is I can just <laughs> lean up, and this isn't a setup at all. But there's 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 a couple of books that I've got on coaching. So if, if you enjoy reading, then um, actually the, I've read a few around coaching. These are just two that are on the bookcase. Probably one of the most famous names in coaching, and funnily enough, he used to be a racing driver, um, is Sir John Whitmore. Uh, Sir John was one of the four people who really developed the GROW model, which is still the most famous uh, model for coaching. So John Whitmore's or now Sir John or Sir John Whitmore's coaching for performance is always worth a look. I would I would recommend if you can get a copy of this and it turns out sometimes it's a bit like hen's teeth trying to get this. The complete guide to coaching at work by Zeus and Skiffington is for me still the single best resource I've ever come across for coaching. And if if you look at just how many little tabs I've got in there, the, the number of time the number of times I've read this book it's probably the book I've read the most out of all the resources I've got on on anything. It is such a good book. The Zeus and Skiffington book, um, Coaching at Work, is excellent. Now, failing that, there are resources that you can get online. Um, if you go to the New Results website, there are free resources on there. There are some videos, and equally, there are some um, very short e-books. There's a lot of free content that's out there. and. I suppose with with any of these, you, you kind of start by understanding, well, why, why do I want to be a coach? Um, some of the things that we'll cover later in this yeah. that Simon and I will be discussing will help to to identify well, what, are the, what are some of the, the key skills that I need to yeah. develop. Yeah. And actually what comes as a surprise to a lot of people is just how transferable the skill set that they've already got is into coaching. So I hope, I hope that's answered, uh, answered the question there. I mean, it's good. Thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, again, yeah, the kind of essential skill is really in coaching. I mean, your problem here is it's listening, questioning, silence, and, and summarizing. Yeah, and, and what's interesting is actually just following on from that, that, uh, that question that we had there is mm. you look at the skill sets there, and these are things if, if, you're in, if you're in sales, these will be skills that you've probably got already. If you're in customer service or experience, these are skills you've got already. If you ever communicate with another person, another human being, these would be some skill sets you're already using. And all, uh, the nice thing about coaching is so many people have got these essential skills and probably all they need to do is appropriate them in a slightly different way. One of the biggest blockages to coaching, actually the two biggest blockages to coaching, I would say that I've experienced over the last 25 years is one understanding is this 
the appropriate tool to use. I should I be coaching or should I be using one of the other things? And then when they've recognized that, okay, I should be coaching, is the, the, the second biggest challenge is to park your assumptions. So the questioning, uh, and we'll talk about this in a, in a little bit more detail in a second, questioning is so important because if we don't ask the questions, what we'll do is we'll, we'll let our assumptions run away, our biases will kick in, and we'll, we'll end up looking at it from our point of view rather than helping the coachee, the learner, to think about it from yeah. their perspective. Uh, and then listening, again, I'll, sh I'll share with you um, the number one practical way to improve your listening uh, and, and one that we, we met with the listening team at the NHS and we asked them how do they help people to improve their listening. And we told them what we do and they said, yeah, that's exactly what we do. So we know it works. Um, Silence is important, and then summarising, playing things back. But it's how you play it back that's important. So there's a couple of couple of questions come up there. Yeah, uh, let's have it. So uh, this is from uh, another Simon, not me. Um, listen versus active listening. Remind us about the differences, Mike, please. I'm, I'm going to go beyond just reminding you of the difference. I'm going to tell you exactly how you can do it. The, okay. the difference, the difference between listening and, and active listening is uh, to what extent your biases are at play, and and what I mean by that is. When so the, the third bit is hearing, but hearing is an unconscious thing. Listening is a conscious thing. We have to choose to listen. I liken it to doing mental arithmetic. So when you're listening, you have to choose to listen as opposed to hearing. Hearing is more like breathing. You don't normally have to think about it. Your body takes over and does it itself. Listening, you have to consciously think about it. Active listening is where you're deciding to pick out certain bits of information and consciously putting your biases on hold so that what you're not doing instead is you're, you're waiting for somebody to say something so you can pounce on it. So you, the, the, big, the big difference between them is you park your biases, but equally you're trying to seek to understand what is the intent to what somebody is saying when you are listening to them in active listening. But, but what I'll do on the on the next slide is I'll talk about this technique that helps you to do that okay. and helps to park biases. Uh, and what's this along? Can coaching also be beneficial to help to motivate your team too? Yeah. So so coaching um, because of because of the effect that it has on the brain and um, um, this bit I was talking about earlier with the stickier learning. What the founders um, through neuroplasticity also causes people to be uh, to feel more motivated. And that's really important. I know, Simon, we were chatting earlier, weren't we, about this. There was a five-year study that was done between 2010 and 2015. And this was a global study. This isn't one of those studies where it's a small sample size over a short period and done in one part of the world. This was a global study that was done between 2010 and 2015. And over 20,000 participants, including over 50 large organizations. And what they were looking at is how motivated do people feel working in the normal office environment compared to working at home? And what they found was for, for all, all respondents, those who were working at home, working remotely, and whether that was part of their normal job or not to work from home, they were less motivated. When you look at those who were not given the option, so think about through the lockdown, how many yeah. people are now working from home and given the choice they wouldn't be doing, they're even less motivated. So coaching plays an important part in terms of motivation, but it's kind of wrapped up in, in a bigger piece. The, the, some of our clients are running a Monday and a Thursday or Monday and a Friday um, group Zoom or Teams session, and they're getting everyone together, and that's good. But in, in those Teams and, and group sessions, there's, 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 three, there's three bits that I would recommend or three questions that you would be asking each person which sits with coaching and also has been shown to improve motivation. And I wrote these down because I wanted to make, in case it came up, I wanted to make sure I got these in the right order. So first of all, ask each person, so this isn't as a team as a whole, this is asking each person during this call. Recommendation is, what have you learned this week? So if you're doing this on a Monday, talking about the previous week that's gone, or if you're doing it on the Friday, talking about the Monday to Friday as it's gone, what have you learned this week? What impact did you have? And what do you want to learn next week? And, and you think about those questions and how wide and broad those questions are. And we're not telling anybody anything. We're simply asking them. And then what, what's important from a motivation point of view and is essential for remote teams especially is some people might be wondering, why am I still working? Why am I doing this? Why am I being asked to do this piece of work? And so what's important to increase the motivation for teams who are working remotely is to always give the why behind the piece of work 
that you've asked the team to do. Because the more we can understand the underlying reason why we're doing something, the more likely we, we are to be brought into it, the more that we are going to be motivated by it, which affects attitude, which affects behaviour. So that's yeah. it's a cracking question. I know that I really enjoyed the, um, the webinar that you did last week with Johnny, and I know there's some great content in there which will also help to answer answer that question that came up there. Yeah, I mean, we may even do another one because it, 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 you know, engagement keeps popping up. I think everyone is, you know, um, there are so many people that are doing it for the first time all together. Yes. Um, yeah, it, it, it's a real challenge. Yeah, it is. And, and, and I get why telling is the easy option because it's quick, it's easy. Um, you know, there's more people who've been writing about being all zoomed out with meetings and and I understand that. So, so sometimes the, the quick text response, the, the quick email back is easy. And, and I know in some cases it's because there is a culture of getting an audit trail. And, mm. and I understand all of those reasons why sometimes we want to tell, but the benefits of coaching over telling are far greater. I, I wrote a piece, I was, I was chatting with some mental health experts last week. They prompted me to write a piece over the weekend. Uh, and again, I think we'll talk about this in a second, but... But if you think coaching is important generally, wait until we start to move back into whatever the, whatever and whenever the new business as usual is, whatever that looks like, I'll explain why coaching is going to be even more important as we as we move into that new world, whatever that might look like. Yeah. Should we look, so, at, should we look at how we develop yeah. these and some quick tips on this? Quick tip. Yeah, quick tip. So, so the question is important. And the, the three things I would remember when you're shaping the questions is, um, well, first of all, you, you, you're not shaping the question because you've got an answer in mind. We're not trying to not steer someone. We're not, we're not using rhetorical questions. We're not using leading questions. We want to use kind of pure, big open questions. And to be fair, the, the, I know the, there's many ways you can do it, but the three best ones from a starting point of view is ask the what, ask the how, and ask somebody to tell you more. And then I suppose once you've done those three things, it's important that we very politely shut up and listen to what's then being said. And if you're doing this face to face, or if you're doing it through as we're doing this now, Simon, give some clues that you have finished, uh, and some visual clues might be if you've, you know, if you've got a pen, it might be that you put the pen to your lips, it might be that you put the your hand to your mouth in somewhere, and as I've done there, I put my head on a slight angle. Now these might seem kind of contrived, but these are all little clues that say to the other person, "I've shut up now, and I'm going to stay shut up, and I'm going to listen. This is your time to speak." And those little encouragers of the, the gentle nodding again, the head on the side, they're all clues to the other person that I've now shut up and it's your turn to speak. And I'm going to stay quiet. And as good as some of the questions that what the how they tell me more can be, you, it's, it's very rare you're going to find a better question that will elicit more information than silence. So staying yeah. quiet, giving the clues that I'm going to be quiet now, really powerful. Yeah, so one yeah, of the things I, that... Yeah. I think it, it, that's really interesting because I think we're all using Zoom so often now. Um, yes, but yeah, but we can learn, you know, how not just how to use it, but how to use it correctly. Um, you're, you're right there about using your hand and to let people know that you start speaking. Yes, the the bit there around note taking is important, and and in terms of how we do the note taking, um, what I would say is have a look at if you've if not used it before, have a look at using mind mapping. And the reason why mind mapping has proven to be so good from a coaching point of view is it helps you to spot where the gaps are. When you write lists, it, it's very difficult to spot where there are gaps. And there's quite a bit of research has shown that just writing pages of notes in a in a linear fashion doesn't really sit with how the brain works in terms of accessing it and making sense of it. But but note note taking in a mind mapping format is much better with spotting others gap there let's explore that or when you said that simon let tell me more about what what that was about and tell me more about what that means to you so note taking is really good in terms of developing the questioning side and it also helps to support the the listening side practicing listening this is uh, this is the, the the cracking exercise that you can do instantly um to make your listening skills better and it is known as the rapid repeat technique. And what happens when we're listening is we have we have a bit of a, um, we, we have some capacity, I think would be the polite way of putting it. So, so somebody somewhere did some very clever research and said the human brain can process the spoken word at between 800 and 1200 words a minute. We can still make sense of it. So if you take a recording of someone speaking, you speed it up and you play it, 
you can still understand what is being said but the problem is most people don't talk at that speed so your brain can process up to that speed of spoken word but most people will talk between about 120 and 150 words a minute so this is big capacity so when someone's talking your brain can quite easily get bored and given that you have to consciously decide to listen, that makes it even more difficult. Your brain can decide, oh, well, what's that shiny thing? Is that a squirrel running around in the trees outside? <laughs> so we get easily distracted. And one of the ways that you can take up some of that slack, that you can use some of that capacity, is using this thing called the rapid repeat technique. And all it is is when somebody's talking, you instantly repeat the words, but only in your head. Don't repeat it out loud because <laughs> people think you're taking the mic. Yeah. So when somebody's so talking, you instantly, like a fraction of a second afterwards, you repeat exactly what they're saying, but in your own head. And some of the people who are listening on this might be giving it a go now. When you get really good at it, and this is much the amusement of my youngest daughter, what you can do is you can, you, you can have somebody saying something and it can look like you're saying exactly the same thing at the same time that they're doing. And you know that you've really got this down as a, as a technique. When somebody else is talking, and if you are able to say effectively say the same things at the same time as them, even though it's unscripted, and it's purely the application of the rapid repeat technique, using it will help to improve your listening, and it, it will make you a better coach. It is quite tiring at first, I'll, I'll give you that. We've got a couple more questions. So can you coach very large teams? Is there a limit? to team numbers uh right so, so you, this is this is where it starts to cause a bit of an argument in the coaching fraternity i guess mm -hmm. some people would say that if you are going into the the bigger realm of coaching the larger teams you kind of have to ask yourself am i now technically coaching am i facilitating or am i really training them so we need to understand are, are we coaching we we would and your results we tend to coach i'm going to say 95 percent of the time plus we will coach on a one-to-one -one basis okay maybe that's the nature of the work we do i would i would say that whilst in sport they will talk about people being coaches and you could technically you could set a challenge and you could ask the group to interpret it and i'm thinking from a sports situation the ones who are most likely to do that will be baseball uh, will be basketball coaches basketball coaches are probably the closest in most sports to be able to say in a clean way they are coaching the team so they are most likely to say here's the plan here's how their team's working uh, this is what we want to achieve go out there and kind of you're empowered to go and interpret that and put it into play how you see fit yeah. um I, I would suggest that coaching is better when it's on a one-to-one -one basis it isn't to say that you can't do it with a larger team but i would say yeah. focus on doing it on a one-to-one -one and have a look at Really, if I'm doing this for a bigger team, am I really talking about facilitation or am I talking about training, perhaps? Yeah. Uh, how, how do you tune out the distractions when listening? Uh, it, it's, a, it's a decision. You have to choose to do it. You have to choose to focus, and focus is one of the bits that we'll look on later on. And again, that's not a, it's not a cop-out answer. It's not a, a try answer. It is you have to choose to block out everything else. And, mm -hmm. and, and again, there's, there's loads of research around this that suggests that we have something called um, inattention. You think about the millions of bits of data that are coming into your brain constantly, and some have put it anywhere between 11 million uh, and uh, 32 billion pieces of data that are coming into you every single second. Yeah. Most of that, fortunately, the, the, the unconscious part of the brain takes care of it and says you don't need to worry about that because it, it would it would drive it would drive you to mental instability if you were trying to process that amount of information constantly. You, you just, you're not, we're not set up to do it. Uh, and, and talking from personal experience of someone who's had a, um, a brain hemorrhage, where during that process, it, it, you are taken outside of that normal uh, wow. bandwidth. Um, so talking from very personal experience, I know that it is very uh, disarming and very damaging to be in that place where you've got more data coming in than you can consciously process. So most people most of the time can consciously process around about seven pieces of information. So if you can only focus in on about seven bits of information, you better be clear certainly in coaching that you are not using up any of that with things that are of no value. So certainly when coaching, we need to park our own biases, we need to increase our own awareness of what am I actually focused on? And um, when somebody's talking, what were the words they use? What do those words mean to them? Not what do they mean to me? Why did they use that pattern of words? 
So, so, so the language side is really important. So when it comes back to how do you tune out the distractions, you genuinely have to choose to listen and block everything else out. But there are certain things you can do. So for example, I'm in my office at home. Um, I'm, I'm one of four people in the house. My two young children, in the, I know they've got the rabbits probably in the house as we speak. And, and it's about setting up in advance what are some of the things I can do to minimise the distractions. And I, I've just said to them, I said, you know, I'm going to be on this call from two o'clock. It's really important. Please don't come upstairs. Can keep the noise down. And the door is shut. And that's kind of one of the sets of things I can do to minimise the yeah, distractions yeah. Uh, and be focused on on this call. All, all the other computers in the room are switched off. My phone's over here, switched off. So I'm minimising the distractions instead of focusing on this. Yeah, I, I, I think that yeah. no, I think it does. I know I find myself having often to have a podcast on in the background because I'm used to be in an office, and, it, and yeah. things, I kind of need to adapt my you know my my, my own way of working really. So that, yeah, it's into like a new environment. The, the the last one on there then the playback the mm. fact not opinion. Yeah. Um, again, one of the things that we advise new coaches to be mindful of is if they've if they've observed something or there's yeah, if we've observed something, so we've heard or, heard or seen something, it's important that we play back the facts. So what I heard, what you said, what I saw, as opposed to I think, because yeah. I think is not what happened. It's your interpretation. You, it's gone through quite a bit of editing in your brain. But if we can be, stay as close to facts as possible and play back what's called the evidential feedback. Uh, and one of the bits to look for is not only I think, but also do you think that so so do you do you think that could have gone better well what am i really saying is i think that could have gone better so we need to be very mindful with again the language but it all comes from what's our level of awareness what are our biases that are at play and as far as possible which is difficult for, for all of us as humans is to park those things to raise yeah. our levels of awareness and to to understand what our biases are and to as far as possible park them so that when we're coaching it is clean and this is this is part of the reason why coaching is and it sounds ridiculous saying it, but when I'll tell you what, when, when I've been in a coaching session for an hour or two hours, I'm tired afterwards. And, and that's mm. normally a good sign because I know that I've put the effort in and I've focused and, yeah, it just took it out of you. Yeah. That's my story exactly. anyway. Exactly. Um, so that, actually, that kind of links in really, doesn't it, to the next slide really, which is this, the challenges of remote coaching. So again, focus. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and, and, and one, of, one of the big bits around this, I, was, I think we were saying earlier, weren't we, that we need to understand what remote means for each person. And, and this is whether you're coaching or, um, or just for the good health of mm -hmm. anybody who's working remotely when they're not used to it, is what does remote mean? What does it mean to each person? For each of us, it means something different. And it's not to say that because it means this today, I'm led to believe today is Tuesday. It doesn't mean that because this is what it means to you today, this is what it will mean for you tomorrow. But but does, does remote mean I'm distant? Does it mean I'm out of sight? Does it mean I've been forgotten about? And it's not somebody who's saying, oh, you know, please pity me or woe is me. It's not that. It's seriously important that we consider how is that person feeling today? And I know we're wandering off into management, again, good mental health, but we need to appreciate what does remote mean to each person. And because it means to me, actually, I can probably crack on and get more done because I don't have a commute. Yeah. For others, it might not mean that. So for me, it might be actually it gives me some great advantages. It doesn't mean that's going to be true for everybody. So does it mean that they are distant? Does it mean that they feel forgotten? Does it mean that actually I've been presented with a great opportunity because I've saved three hours of commuting every day? Great. So that, that might be positive. For others, does it mean I'm working from home and it's very – actually, my, my office at home is as nice as the office – in the office, or yeah. it's not as nice. The connection that I've got with the tech isn't as good. The network's not as strong. D does it mean that I feel safe or does it mean I feel vulnerable? So, so we need to consider what, what – and that's not a limitless list – but what does remote mean to each person in the team? And then we get on to some of the things, some of the questions that have been uh, raised, or it's of great questions. It's so easy to get distracted by devices, by all of the alternatives. And the number of people on LinkedIn have been posting photographs of, of the fridge open, because the fridge is a big distraction. You know, we get bored, we've got access yeah. to things that probably most of us at work 
we don't have as much of a ready access to the kettle or to the fridge or just to have a wander around. I'm very lucky I back onto a farm and I can go for a wandering home because social distancing, this is perfect where we live, just out there. There's, yeah, there's, yeah. there's acres of land with nobody on it and I can go for a wander and the next living creature I'm going to see will probably be a horse up in a field somewhere. Yeah. So, so there are these distractions that, that are, some of them are tech, some of them are other people, some are daughters, the rabbits, if they wanted to come in, they're known to come in. And we need to get cut through all of that and say, this is a coaching session, get rid of everything that's a distraction. Tech, not only is it working properly, so from a challenge point of view, um, and different internet providers have been having different issues over the last few weeks because bandwidth has been taken up. So understanding not only is the tech working, don't know how to use it, but actually is it the best one for the person who I'm coaching and give them the option. So as the coach, it's not up to us to say, we're going to do this through Zoom or Teams or Skype or whatever. Give give the coachee the option to say, what are they most comfortable with? Because they, they might prefer a phone call because they might not want you to see them in whatever state they're in at that point. They might not want that. Yeah, Location's sure. important. So again, it needs to be somewhere where everybody feels safe, where everybody feels that they can talk openly. At the minute, I've got a headset in, which is great. It means nobody else in the house can hear what you're saying to me. But I'm talking and other people in the house might be able to hear what I'm saying. Now, if this was coaching, it might be I don't want other people to be able to hear what I'm saying. So again, get yourself to a place where not only you feel safe, but you feel comfortable enough that this is right for me if I'm going to be coached. Putting the time aside, Again, this is all going to be led by the coachee, the learner, to say this is how long. If it goes past an hour, you know what, I'm going to start flagging. Or it might be that they need a break. So uh, yeah. last coaching session I had with somebody um, was a two-hour session, and it was about 55 minutes in. Uh, and we did it using uh, Teams, Microsoft Teams. And after about 55 minutes, we could just looking at each other and went, yeah, do you need a break as well? And it's not disrespectful, it's just re recognising two human beings probably need a break, right, let's have a 10-minute break, grab a cup and come back in 10 minutes. There's nothing wrong with that. But equally also, what's the best time? Now, when I was working with a client in Vancouver, we were kind of forced to pick a time because there's an eight-hour time difference. But I'm not going to dictate a guy called David. I'm not going to dictate to David, this is when we're going to do it. It just so happened that it was... Um, six o'clock at night here and 10 o'clock in the morning there that worked well for me, but more importantly, worked well for David as the coach. Yeah. And again, mm -hmm. the remote coaching challenge is what are the easier alternatives? Telling is always easier than coaching, but doesn't mean it's the right one. So these are some of the challenges that, that we face when we are coaching generally, but these are some very specific ones for remote coaching. Okay. And then solutions. Uh, I think you kind of you've got going to some of Yeah, the, 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 massive, the, isn't it? Yeah, they're all, they're all there. We just need to think about. We know that there are challenges, particular to remote coaching, uh, and there are some of the solutions. And some people might be thinking they're dead obvious. Yeah, they are, but they're also the ones that work. Yeah, and when you say that coachy led, is, is that where? So, do we explain that a little bit more? Yeah, so, so the, the beauty of coaching, so if you think about training, let's position it against mm -hmm. training. Training tends to be led by the trainer, and I'm speaking as a trainer. Yeah. I will have been asked to go in and develop a program, and of course I'm mindful of what does each of the trainees in the room want to get from it as well. But in essence, as a program that's been agreed, and yeah, we'll deviate around it, and we'll wander and we'll cover other things that are relevant to their role in the development of the skill or knowledge but at the same time it's it is to an extent and then trainers on this call will, will possibly be nodding that it kind of is trainer led if you're a mentor and the whole concept of mentoring it is very much led by the mentor yeah but coaching is different coaching is led by the coachee so the pace you go at the things that want to be covered so i talked about the show jumper i was there as a coach and it just turned out that this person was a show jumper and wanted to talk about clearing from whatever it was five foot eight up to six foot but that was all led by it wasn't me saying well why are you not doing six foot six it was all for the coach he to said this is what i want to achieve these are the time scales um okay. both nev and i have worked with former olympians and again the I mean, olympians are, are just talk about uh unconscious super competence that they are phenomenal to work with 
that they're a different breed, but again, it's still at their pace and what they want to get out of the situation and out of the, the coaching session. Yeah. I, you know, in your experience, how, how do you find um, remote workers? Are they more upfront in asking what their, their, their needs are for coaching? Is it, is it harder being that kind of distance? It, th this, is where, this is where we just have to be mindful of not how I feel as the coach, because how I feel is my, my natural response to that is it's no more difficult. But I realize what I'm doing is I'm talking from the point of view of being the coach. What I need to be is mindful of what does it feel like for the coachee. So yeah. what what will happen as part of it is so so um so the temptations to give names. I can't give names clearly from mm -hmm. a confidentiality point of view. So a client who who had never been coached remotely before, so they were in as a lot of us are. They were working instead of working in the normal office, they're working from home. And there was yeah. um, uh, again that was Teams. We were using Teams, but I thought, hang on, I, I don't know if they've been through this before. I don't know how they're feeling about it. So we had a call in advance. I thought well, you remember good old fashioned phone calls. We had a phone yeah, call yeah. in advance, and we talked through it, and it's just really exploring. What, what, all those things that are on the screen. So where, where are you going to be most comfortable? Um, how do you want to do this? Do you want to do this through Teams or Zoom or Skype or whatever's going to work for you? What, what Practically, what can work for you? If you're in that part of your building where you feel safe, secure, you're able to talk openly, have you got access to a phone signal? Have you got access to your internet? And, and it's always been mindful of what is appropriate for that person. And that phone call, I know that phone call in advance, caused that first coaching session to probably be more effective than it would have been had we not had that phone call in advance. And then all it yeah. is is, in, in my case, just purely because I've been coaching for so long, you're saying just because I feel comfortable with it doesn't mean that this coachee will equally feel comfortable doing this when we're not in the same room. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. And um, we're going to move on to your, your, your summary. Um, so, yeah, again, it's just another tool. It's not, it's not a... A suits everyone for every every solution. It, it's not. It's it's as with any tool in any toolkit. You know, downstairs in the garage, I've got a whole bunch of tools, but I wouldn't naturally go. Oh, there's a jigsaw. I'll use a jigsaw when what I'm trying to do is screw something into the wall. You know, you've yeah. got to think what what is it that's trying to be achieved here. The difference with coaching is what is the coach he was the learner trying to achieve, and therefore what is the right tool. There are there are other ways to assess where is somebody at and whether or not coaching is the best tool to use I, I would recommend as a starting point give the conscious competence model a go and say yeah. where is somebody have that discussion where do they think they are talking them through it and say yeah. in terms of this skill in terms of where you are now tell me where you are and how do you know that's where you are and if it turns out they're in that bottom left and it might be that training is more appropriate great we we'll use training if they're in that bottom right and want to move up to the top right of that conscious competence to con uh, unconscious competence coaching is probably the best tool to use but coaching isn't the only tool in the toolkit it's not a panacea yeah the, the when and why again we need to we need to think about is so coaching uh, technically might be the best tool to use but in this situation if it's an emergency situation we need to take immediate res immediate action we need to respond immediately you know what it, it still might be the coaching isn't appropriate but it might be that later when you come back and review it and you could turn it into that review process might cause it to become a coaching situation the focus and location are key i think we've talked about it in quite a bit of detail yeah. but it's so important to, for remote working the, those key three there of ask stop and listen remember and give the clue to the other person that want to stop but the big the big thing i'd like everyone to take away from this is there are easier ways to impart any piece of information but it doesn't mean that because it's easier it will become stickier and there's false economy the num and i've made this i've definitely made this mistake and i'll make the mistake again of people coming to you in your team and saying how do you do that and it might be that 10 times they've asked me how to do this particular thing and each time i just tell them because it's quicker it's easier it's dealt with yeah. as opposed to thinking consciously flagging somebody's asked they've asked me that a lot of times now i keep telling them but they probably don't need to be told this many times and it might be it's a training opportunity or it might be instead actually i probably need to coach them because i'm guessing if i've told them 10 times and know they've been trained what's the underlying reason why they still come to yeah. be asked that and let's see if that's a coaching i says there's another question through simon 
Yep. Uh, we use project managers frequently in our business to manage teams. Would your typical PMs be a good candidate to learn and take up the coaching role too? Um, so, would project managers be good at this? Um, yeah. One of the clients that I was talking about, you know what I was saying about uh, we took a break after 50 odd minutes and had a cup of tea? Yeah. He's, yeah. A project manager for, he's a project manager for one of the UK's big IT companies. So, um, definitely, I've got case studies for that. We know that, uh, and it's not just because project managers are good at it. Um, depends what methodology coaches, uh, project managers use. I uh, was talking two weeks ago with uh, a really good project manager who's currently working with the NHS, and and we've talked about. And I know he's a particularly good coach, and it seemed, and the coaching style seemed to fit quite nicely with uh, typical agile application anyway. But would project managers be good candidates uh, to to learn and take up coaching? Yeah, definitely. If you are either managing a team or managing a project or generally trying to cause something to happen through other people, whether they report directly to you or through some metric mm. system, then yeah, you use coaching techniques. Because the nice thing is you don't have to have all the answers. And as project managers definitely uh, respect and recognize that with a team, the nice thing is you get this thing called cognitive diversity where not everyone's gonna come at it in exactly the same way and that's how my understanding of Agile and the application of it, it, it comes into its own when you have that cognitive diversity and we respect that and coaching is a great way to tease that out and get things done more efficiently, more effectively in ways that probably no one else would have thought, oh, we could do it that way. Yeah. Nice answer. Well, thank you for that. No, you're welcome. Uh, I want to say thank you to you, Simon, for what you're doing at Invendo, putting these sessions on. I hope that's been useful and I hope there's been no, some benefit in that. But thanks, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Um, we've got someone typing. So, well, I'll just flick to the next slide. Ah, oh, it's got the same. Thanks, Ed. That's really useful. Um, oh, that's very kind. Thank you. Yeah, um, Mike, I'm, I'm sure we we'll didn't have one with you or Neville in the, fu in the future. Um, our next webinar is going to be on keeping your team fit and healthy during isolation. Uh, so that'll be coming up soon. We'll post this, uh, the whole recording will be on aboutavendor.com. And yeah, just um, if you've got any questions you want about any future webinars, please, anyone, just drop us a line and we'll, we'll have a look. And Mike, thank you so much. Thanks, Simon. All the best. Yeah, pleasure. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.